the next few minutes um, speaking on the topic waiting for the cloud waiting for the cloud and I'm going to take my text from the book of Numbers chapter 9 and you permit me I would want to read through the verses of reference here Numbers chapter 9 15 to verse 23 I'm reading from verse 15 to verse 23 and on the day that the tabernacle was reared up the cloud covered the tabernacle namely the tent of the testimony and even there was upon the tabernacle as it were the appearance of fire until the morning so it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night and when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle then after that the children of Israel journeyed and at the place where the cloud abode there the children of Israel pitched their tents. At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of the Lord, they pitched. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle, many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and journeyed not. And so it was, when the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle, according to the commandment of the Lord, that they abode in their tents, and according to the commandments of the Lord, they journeyed. Verse 21. And so it was, when the cloud abode from even unto the morning, and that the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they journeyed, whether it was by day or by night, that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. Or whether it were two days or a month or a year, that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle, remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed. Verse 23. At the commandment of the Lord, they rested in the tents. And at the commandments of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Amen. This account is quite significant. And it is one which I know is not new to many of us. As at this time, the children of Israel had left the land of Egypt two years. Precisely, see verse 15 saying, and on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, that is on the day it was erected, on the day it was set up. And that day was the first day in the first month when it was exactly two years that they left Egypt. That very day that it was erected, the cloud of the Lord rested upon the tabernacle as a signification of the presence of God with the children of God. You know quite well that that tabernacle is equally known as a tent of the testimony. So the coming of the cloud was to let them know God was with them. For the night time, that cloud took up the appearance of a fire. Meaning it was ever present with them. Always available for them. And it rested on the tabernacle and everybody that was inside the tabernacle. And you begin to wonder what was the essence of this cloud. It was actually to serve as a guide for the children of Israel through the pathless desert. The trackless desert. It was a journey they had never undergone before. It was a journey that had no predetermined route. It was a journey that had no, it had no path for them to tread. But the tabernacle was there for them to guide them. And the amazing thing about this scripture is that for as long as the cloud rested upon the tabernacle, they remained in the tabernacle. You see in that scripture, the Bible says even if it was for a day or two, a month or even for a year, they remained there. We are looking at the topic, waiting for the cloud. And the question comes, what was it that they were waiting for whenever they waited? Of course, it was for the cloud to move. Meaning all along, they had sentinels that were always on guard to this mantle the tabernacle, carry the tent, carry the poles, carry, carry the ropes, and make for the journey whenever the cloud moved. But in as much as the cloud rested, 
they remained. Let's look at verse 17 closely again. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed. And at the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. Verse 18. At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed. And at the commandment of the Lord, they pitched. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. As long as the cloud rested upon the tabernacle, they rested. They relaxed. They waited. They tarried. Just waiting for the next moving of the cloud. I looked at these two verses in the message Bible. Permit me to read what I have here. According to the message Bible, verse 17 says, When the cloud lifted above the tent, the people of Israel marched out. And when the cloud descended, the people camped. In verse 18, the people of Israel marched at God's command and they camped at his command. As long as the cloud was over the dwelling, they camped. The Amplified Version says they remained encamped. The Bible in basic English says they did not go from that place. In other words, they waited. Beloved, whenever you visit the ATM, the auto teller machine, you have need of patience. Especially if the queue is long, you have to wait patiently for your turn on the queue. And when it gets to your turn, what do you do with the card? You insert it into the machine and then you enter your pain. You follow other instructions up to entering the amount you want to collect. And having done this, you hear a voice from inside the machine saying, please wait. Your transaction has been processed. And the amazing thing about this is this. You don't hurry away. You wait patiently for the machine to release your money. Is that not? And then why do you do this? The reason is in two folds. Number one, because your card is inside the machine. Number two, because the machine has spoken. And the amazing thing to me, curiously, I wonder that after some time, the machine will produce a thunder kind of sound, a rumble from inside. When you hear the grrr, that means something is coming. And more often than not, some of us will begin to bring out our paws, begin to set our get set to leave the damn place. At times, even if it's a bushman, he'll put his hand at the mouth of the machine. Why? Because the sound is the sound of a cloud. There is going to be a movement very soon. And indeed, the money comes out. Amazingly, many of us believe the ATM so much that we don't even count the money we put in our pocket and go away. Is that not it? But then now let me ask you, who is that lady or that gentleman that speaks from inside the machine? You do not know him or you do not know her. Yet, you believe her so much that she has spoken, the money will come. How much more when the almighty God speaks? When he tells you, wait until the cloud moves. Then you just have to wait because he has spoken. But if at the teller machine, you get tired of waiting, you get annoyed because the thing is not bringing out the money quick enough and you leave it after hearing, please wait, your transaction is being processed. I'm sorry to announce to you that another person will harvest your labor. May that not be your portion in the name of Jesus Christ. There is a big danger in not waiting. We are going to look at an account from 1 Samuel chapter 13 from verse 1 to 14. 1 Samuel 13 1 to 14. From verse 1. I will not be reading we just paraphrasing a few verses and look at what God wants us to see from this account. 1 Samuel 13, 1 to 14. At this time, Saul had been two years into his reign. And then there was going to be a battle against the Philistines. And I wonder, the battles keep coming back from the Philistines. They keep coming back. This was one of such battles again. What did Saul do? He gathered an army 
of 3,000 soldiers. How many did I call it? Can you announce it like you are still here? 3,000 soldiers. And he had to devise a, a, a means of fighting that battle. What did he do? He gathered to himself 2,000 soldiers at Mikmash. Then he sent another 1,000 soldiers with uh, Jonathan to Gibeah. That they were going to discomfit the Philistines. But while at Gibeah, even before the sound of war was given, I wouldn't know what pushed Jonathan. His own 1,000 men smote some Philistines. And this brought out a great anger out of the Philistines. They were seriously annoyed. The Bible says they had the Israelites in abomination. Another version says they disdained them. And I wondered what the reason was. I discovered there was a treaty between them at that time. Maybe that there will be no war or there will be no killing or there will be no battle until the sound had been made. But Jonathan went ahead and smote some Philistines. The news got to Saul. And Saul seen that the enemies were very angry. He knew that there was a problem. And indeed, according to that account, in verse 5 of that chapter, the Bible says that the Philistines raised a special army made up of 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and soldiers that were too many to count like the sand of the sea against just 3,000 men. Saul knew that problem had come. Out of fear, the Bible says the children of Israel, some of them hid themselves in caves, some in pits, some on hills, some ran out of the town. As a matter of fact, the Bible says some of them went across the Jordan to the city of God. To do what? To hide there. And some went across Jordan to the city of Gilead to hide there. Because they knew there was a big problem coming. Another version says, some of them ran abroad across the Jordan. Like a lot of people are running abroad for greener pastures. Whereas the Bible says, every good and every perfect gift cometh from where? From above, not necessarily from abroad. But the Bible says they ran abroad. They fled abroad. But Saul remained in Gilgal. And while he was there, the few people that remained with him, the Bible says they trembled. They were seriously afraid. I guess Saul did not show fear. But then you know, when a big man like a king begins to smile from at intervals, <laughs> And he shakes his head. <laughs> that means real trouble is coming. So those who were with him, they trembled. But Saul had to tarry. Based on an instruction that prophet Samuel will be coming. The Bible says he tarried for seven days. The appointed seven days. By the end of the seventh day, Saul had not showed up. So the Bible lets us know that the people scattered. Even the few people remaining with him, they scattered. I wouldn't know the points you have gotten to in your life and it appears like you are in a crowd, yet you are lonely. There are many people around you, yet you feel lonely. The people are smiling, you look at them. What is the cause of this smile? They are laughing and you say to yourself, is there anything to laugh about in this world? The people remaining with him, they scattered. They left him all alone because he was waiting for the seven days that the prophet had promised. Quickly, let's turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 10. Just a few pages from where you are. Back. Chapter 10 verse 8. You will know there was an agreement between Samuel and Saul. What did Samuel say in verse 8? And thou shalt go before me to Gilgal. And behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days, seven days shall thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. 
they were together where they were he told him to go over to Gilgal and that he will come and meet him in Gilgal but he should tarry for seven days an appointment seven days at the end of the seventh day I mean on the, by, within that time I will come to offer the burnt offerings and even sacrifice the sacrifices of the peace it was a promise he said wait till I come to thee and show you what you shall do meaning even before the enemies gathered before the children of Israel got into trouble the prophet had promised the king that he will be coming to show him the way out of a problem that had not come. However, seeing that the people had scattered, what did Saul do? The Bible says he went on to offer the burnt offering because the prophet was staying too late. This is the seventh day. He went ahead to do what he was not qualified to do. Let's see verse 10 together of that 1 Samuel chapter 13. Verse 10. Please, if you are there, can you say amen? amen. 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 13. I'm sorry, chapter 13 verse 10. 1 Samuel 13 10. Thank you. Now can we read together in the chorus? 1, 2. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, Behold, Samuel came and Samuel, and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. There were a set of offerings to make. The first of them was the burnt offering followed by the sacrifices of the peace offering. So the first step had just been concluded when the news came from outside that the prophet had come. He went out to salute him. Shara lay, you are welcome, holy prophet. But what did the prophet say in verse 11? Samuel said, what hast thou done? Take note from verse 10. We will see that the prophet came punctually still. He said it will come in seven days, the appointed time. So it was on the seventh day that Saul could no longer wait. He went ahead to offer the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished that, the prophet came. The prophet came. He came. He actually came. Take notes. To Saul, he did not come to time. But he came on time. You know what? When we have our own time schedules, we want God to come to time. But actually, my God comes on time. He is never late. Because it does not work with the normal wristwatch human beings work with. Come to think of it, he said he was going to come. Seven days. The seventh day had not elapsed. And we will see why Saul made that big mistake in a short while. He said to him, what have you done? The same question Laban asked Jacob in Genesis 31, 26. What hast thou done? The same question God asked Cain. In Genesis 4.10, what hast thou done? When God asks this kind of question, then it is a serious matter. The same thing that he asked uh, uh, Adam and Eve, where art thou? Even though he had eyes that was going to and fro, he was yet asking where they were. He asked, what have you done? And Saul answered, because I saw that the people were scattered from me and you did not come. Listen. Within the appointed days. Because I saw the people were scattered from me and you did not come. Within the appointed days. The Philistines also gathered at Michmash. That was the reason he gave. I saw you did not come. Within. And I ask. You know why he said Within. Because day one was the beginning of the seven days. The last hour of the seventh day was the end of the seven days. According to the calculation of Saul, he expected Samuel to come before the end of the seventh day. And I tell you, not until the seventh day ended, they were still within the scope of seven days. But he could no longer wait. You did not come within 
What is that within you are calculating? When you took your own calculator and your diary and your own calendar and you are saying within this time I must become a millionaire. If I don't make it by the end of this year, God, you have lost another child. I will backslide. Then you begin to give God a deadline. And I've discovered more often than not, people who give God deadlines end up in dead ends. Because God cannot be cajoled, he cannot be threatened. He said that wait till I come. Seven days is the appointment. But then he added, till I come. In case anything keeps me beyond the seven days, wait. Till I come. But he went ahead to offer that sacrifice. In verse 12. Before verse 12, that verse 11. I saw. I was afraid. I saw. And the question the Lord is asking us this morning is, what is it that you are seeing that is threatening to move, push you to move ahead of God? What is that thing you are saying? My mates have gone ahead of me. Oh, people that we got married together have four children now. People we left school together are currently working in big, big companies around the country. All my mates are overseas. What is that thing you are seeing that is threatening to push you to move ahead of the cloud of glory? He said, the Philistines also gathered. Who are those that are gathering and are pushing you to take a step ahead of the movement of the cloud of glory? Are they in-laws? Are they friends? Are they colleagues? Or even are they saints? I'm talking of church people that are gathering, that are oppressing you as if you are not amounting to anything. Look at the stage in which you are. If you are not careful and you don't know what you are doing, you know, the gathering of cars in the parking lot of a church can make you feel like you are not born again. If you are not careful. And it's not as if you don't have a car. The thing is that your own car is the car that brethren will gather their anointing to help you to push before you leave the church premises. So the gathering of those other sleek cars can make you wonder that God, am I still your child? We are going to look at this in a short while. The Philistines gathered. I saw. Ah, and the frightening part, you will see very soon. Verse 12, he said, I was afraid of the Philistines. I forced myself to offer a burnt offering. I forced myself. The message Bible says, so I took things into my own hands. Because God can no longer handle this matter. I took things into my own hands. mercy. I forced myself. Meaning, look, we can't go into that. You know, we have the spirit, the soul, and the body. So the spirit within was not cooperating with the body for Saul to offer the bond offering. But the soul was giving him reasons. Though the soul went ahead to convince the spirit the two of them gathered their hands to force his body I forced the I is another person the myself is another person we can't go into breaking that but the soul convinced the spirit they cooperated to push the body to do it I forced myself to offer the burnt offering some of you would have heard me tell the story of a man who saw his friend who just became suddenly rich and stinkingly rich for that matter. They were both in deep, deep poverty. But he was out of town for a while and this friend came back. Very rich. So this other partner in poverty asked him, how did you do it? He said, you cannot understand. Understand what? You can't understand how I became this wealthy. He said, of course, there is nothing you explained to me that I will not understand. He said, well, if you understand it, you cannot do it. The man said, I am ready to do anything. Then this friend who suddenly became rich said, if you do what I did, that means you have sold your soul to the devil. Hell is your destination. And the man who became so desperate said, what are you saying? I am already in hell now. There is no hell bigger than poverty. 
Look, show me how you made it. I'm ready for any kind of hell. And lo and behold, this man took him to where he made it. A, a, a town in southwestern Nigeria. Let's forget the name. They got to the Abalis and the Abalis said, well, you want to become rich? As your friend told you what he did, he said, no, he only told me that there is a secret. And the herbalist went ahead. He said, well, there are so many methods. But the one I use for your friend is the one we call the vulture method. Go ahead, Baba, explain. He said, I'm going to turn you into a vulture. I will keep you in a room for seven days. I'll be feeding you there. Things will go on. On the seventh day, I will turn you back into a human being. And then you become rich. Just like that. The man said, yes, go ahead. Baba said, that's all. No shedding of blood. No human sacrifice. Nothing. He said, just that. <laughs> and the man stood up. He said, I am already a rich man. And the Baba said, when do you want to come back to do it? The man said, come back for what? For the ritual. He said, I'm already here now. And lo and behold, they turned the man into a vulture and put him into the room. The friend left for the town. He kept coming. I mean, calling. On the seventh day, he came to receive his friend who would have become a rich man. Only to hear that on the sixth day of the ritual, the herbalist died. Meanwhile, the herbalist was the only one who had the password for turning a human being into a vulture and back into a human being. So he had gone with the password. So it was a friend that now had an encounter that revealed everything that happened. Why? He could not wait. So that's how our friend became an emergency vulture. Someone said in verse 13, you have done foolishly. Kai, what a disrespect for a whole king from a prophet. I'm talking of a real prophet. Not prophets that koto behind politicians and are seen that the world, I mean our nation is in disarray. That Christians are being killed and yet they are giving prophecies that you are the one God chose. The Lord is going to be with you. This one said to a whole king, you have done foolishly. He did not even add sir. You are talking to me, a whole king like that. Look, remove that thing of kingship. That's just a title. So all you have done foolishly. Yes, I've been waiting for years, for months. Well, I've been trusting God for this for longer. The cloud is not really moving over my life. The question I will ask you, why have you not died? So that everything will just end. Why have you not died? It's because there is an appointment. God is coming on time. Forget about God. God come to time. He is coming on time. So he missed it. And the very frightening part. For Samuel 13 verse 13 and verse 14. The King James says the Lord has sought himself a man after his own earth. Take note, the Bible did not say the Lord will seek him. The Lord has sought him. And now this is it. When did God seek out a replacement for him? Because when David was chosen, the account is in chapter 16. And here we are in chapter 13. Saul had not misbehaved. Just at the point he misbehaved. Now, your kingdom would have continued. Now, your kingdom shall not continue. Now, now, God has sought a replacement. Kai, kai, kai. Just like a coach of football. When a player is playing pure, poorly, on the field of play, the man will still be sweating and laboring. But the coach is shaking his head. Even before he talks to the assistant coaches and he talks to the official to announce his number. In his mind, he had already exchanged them. The man may still be there for 10 more minutes. But in the mind of the coach, this one is a waste. Even by the time they are writing the number, putting it on the computer, marching to the side of I mean the sideline to lift it up. The man is still running around. But he had already been replaced. That's why when they raise the number up. Number 4 to go out. For 14 to come in. You see some people they are still looking around. His teammates that will point at him. What is your His teammates that will say you are already substituted. They don't know. I pray we are not in this state today. Where God has already substituted us. 
If that be our case, I pray mercy will locate us. I thought the amen will be bigger. I pray mercy will do what? Locate us. As far as God was concerned, Saul was still seated on the throne, but he was no longer the king. <laughs> Waiting is an important prerequisite for receiving from God. Very important prerequisite. That's why Job 41 verse 14, the A part says, when a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time, will I wait until my change comes? Look at this. We don't have time to go to verse 13. We are the whole thing began. Job now said, when a man dies, will he live again? In other words, this pressure is too much. If I decide to heed the advice of my friends and kill myself, now, if I die, now, so after death, I will now live again and then the problems will be over. So if a man dies, shall he live again? Then he answered to himself, of course not. On the physical terrain, he will not live again. Look, thank you for your advices. All the days of my own appointed time, I will wait until what? Until my change comes. That's why Isaiah 40 verse 30 and verse 31 says, even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall do what? shall renew their strength. They shall do exploits. They shall mount up with wings as eagles and things like that. They that wait. Even the Lord Jesus told them in Luke 24 verse 49. He said, Tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 3 makes us to understand. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. It's yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it shall speak. And it will not tarry. Even though it tarries. Wait for it. It shall not tarry. It will not tarry. If it decides to tarry. Wait for it. It will not tarry. Mm, that's a deep one. It shall not tarry. But in case it looks like it is tarrying. Wait for it. It shall not tarry. Because my God is a God of on time. We are looking at just three benefits of waiting quickly. Three benefits of waiting. Number one, when you wait, you will see the power behind the fire. Exodus chapter 3 verse 1 to verse 6. That's the account of Moses and the burning bush. You remember, he led his father's uh, in-law's sheep to the backside of the desert. The Bible says in verse 1 that he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. The mountain of God is where God gave the law and made a covenant with the children of Israel. The mountain of God is where God is present, but there he was not manifest. He was present, but not manifest. As Moses was going, the Bible says he saw a bush burning, yet was not consumed. And they began to wonder, what kind of bush is this? He decided to turn aside. He was going, but he saw the bush burning. He decided to turn aside. He waited and turned aside and said to himself, I want to see why this bush is burning and yet is not consumed. The Bible says at that point, a voice spoke from inside the fire saying, Moses, Moses calling him twice and I wonder why did the voice not just say hello man or hey there he was specific in case there were other shepherds in that desert at that time in that wilderness at that time God came specifically for Moses the man who turned if you don't turn it cannot be your turn so he turned to see if he had passed by, God would not be benevolent enough to call him all the same. He waited for him to turn. You know why? God caused the bush to be burning and was not consumed to attract his attention. Just the way other people's attention, I mean testimonies, is meant to catch your own attention. That the Lord who did it for these people can do it for me. 
So don't come to a point where you get annoyed when you hear the testimonies of other people. See it as your own burning bush. Celebrate it. And your own time of celebration will come to. And as he turned, the Bible says, God said, put off your shoes because you are standing on holy ground. Indeed, there are some shoes you must put off. Just like we heard yesterday, we are not talking about a re a renovation of the heart. We are talking of a renewal, a new heart. Put off. The Bible makes it clear to us in Colossians chapter 2. I mean chapter 3 verse 8 to verse 9. Put off therefore the old nature. There are things you must put off. There are things you must lay aside. There are some iniquities you must let go of. If indeed you want the cloud to move for you. And God now introduced himself from inside the fire. He said, I am that I am. That was on inquiry. You remember earlier God told him, and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and who? And Jacob. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 14, there about, he asked God, when I get to the people, you told me to go and deliver. And I said to them, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had sent me. What should I say to them? And God said, for the first time, Tell them, uh, and he said to Moses, I am that I am, I sent you. But when you get to them, just tell them I am. Okay, we'll look at this. To you, Moses, my name is I am that I am. But when you get there, remove the rest. Just tell them I am. I am that I am means that he is the self-existent one. That is, he's talking of his immutability. His infallibility, his unchangeability, is the fact that he could not make mistakes. He's talking that I am what I have been. I am what I am. I am what I shall be. I shall be what I am. I am letting you have everything I am. This is what I am. I am that I am. But when you get to them, just say, I am as sent you. That is, he made known unto Moses his ways, but his acts unto the children of Israel. That's why you begin to wonder, why we talk about making known unto Moses his ways. What really are we talking about here? His ways, what exactly are we talking about? That is, Moses knew the process, but the children of God, they knew only the products. Moses knew the process, but they knew only the products. I wouldn't know if some of us have seen this program on television, how it is made. It's one wonderful program on television. How it is made. Revealing how different things are made. Taking us through the process. Very wonderful educative program. There are things I never believed were made the way I saw them on television. So Moses had a knowledge of how things were made. For instance, Genesis 1 from verse 1 to verse 3. Who wrote the book of Genesis? Moses and he said in the beginning I was told God created the heaven and the earth is that he said in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the waters and the spirit of God moved upon the waters and God said let there be and there was light let there be light and there was light so he wrote the book of Genesis as if he was present of course, it was God that made known unto him his ways. He gave a first hand account. Why? How did he get to this point? He's a man that knew the purpose of waiting. Because it takes a patient man to go to the top of a mountain to receive of God the Ten Commandments. Bring them down. After waiting 40 days and 40 nights. And on account of what the people did, he broke it. This time God instructed him to come with another set of tablets. So this time he was going to jot it down. Not in the fingers of God. He waited yet again for another set of commandments. So it takes waiting for you to see the power behind the fire. Number two out of three. When you learn to wait, you will see the Lord. John 20 verse 1 to verse 18. On the first day, after the stipulated time for which Jesus was in the grave, the Bible makes it clear that early in the morning, while it was yet dark, 
a woman known as Mary Magdalene. She ran to the sepulcher. But when she got there, she discovered that the stone had been rolled away. Can I have a sister come over here? Just a sister. And let's do this drama together. A sister? Okay. God bless you. Then I need uh, two brothers. Two brothers. Okay, if there are no brothers in the house. Okay, one brother. Okay, any other brother? Yes, God bless you. Thank you. Right. Please, can the three of you come to this side of the hall? Now, early in the morning, the first day of the week, while it was yet dark, time will not permit me to talk more on this, while it was yet dark. So, this looks to me as if Mary Magdalene had not been sleeping. She was waiting for the day to break, for the first cock to crow, for her to escape her house, to go to the sepulchre. So, while it was yet dark, Mary Magdalene comes over. Come now. She comes here, to the sepulcher. And she peeps. Can I see you peeping? She looks inside. And she discovered that the stone had been rolled away. Looking inside, she saw that the tomb was empty. That the master was no longer there. In fear, she ran back home. Let me see you go back there. Invite Peter and John. My brother in orange is brother Peter. And the one in the native is brother John. She goes ahead to inform them. Tell them what has happened. What did you see? Demonstrate it to them. Yeah, that I didn't see Jesus there. His body had been taken away. And they wondered. I believe they did not even brush their teeth. They just rushed, rushed out of the house. Let me see you begin to come gradually. Begin to come. Then John, move faster. Move faster. Now, because he is younger, he gets to the sepulcher before brother Peter. Hold it there. Brother Peter is still some kilometers away or meters away. But John had got there. You know the, the zeal of the young man. And the peeps, looking inside, he discovered that it's only the napkin you could see. The napkin with which they wrapped the body of Jesus. You come too because she came with them. And she's equally coming and getting here. They arrive together with uh, Brother Peter. As at this time, he is still standing at the door of the sepulchre. We have something we call the outer court Christianity and inner court Christianity. Hey, the outer court is a place of what we are seeing. The inner court is a place of the dealing. So Peter gets there. This man saw only the napkin. He did not stay outside. He actually goes inside the sepulchre and the peeps inside. Now, he is seeing more than he saw. What is the thing he saw? He saw the napkin and the lining with which they wrapped the head of Jesus. He saw the napkin wrapped carefully somewhere and the lining laying as where the head of Jesus was. But Jesus was not there. So, seeing that Peter had gone in to the inner court, John equally followed. Meaning his fear disappeared. You see, your Christianity can encourage another person's Christianity. If you backslide, only God knows how many people will backslide. On account of one backsliding, God forbid it in Jesus' name. Imagine Pastor E.A. Adeboe saying, I am sorry on national television. I've misled a lot of people. I've discovered there is no God. So please, I'm sorry for misleading you. How many people will backslide? Millions. So you may think in your own little corner. I say it again. God forbid it in Jesus name. Pastor E.A. Adeboe and other ministers of God and children of God will stand to the end. So you may think you are small. Who knows me? Somebody knows you. There is a brother John looking at you. Will he enter? See you enter. He entered too. And the two of them look very well. Look around. Is Jesus there? Of course he's no longer there. And then let me see you do your hands like this. And the Bible says they went back to their house. You can go. They went back to their house. Leaving only Mary standing there. So they came. The first one saw the linen with which they wrapped Jesus. You know what the linen is? A wrapper. Biscuit wrapper. Sweet wrapper. So all they came for was a sweet wrapper. And they saw it and it was enough for them. They saw the scarf, the cover for the head. 
the cover of a bottle, bottle of minerals. I remember the days we nearly killed ourselves because of bottle covers, because they said there were some things under. When you get it, you become a millionaire. Around seven, eight, nine, ten years old. Whenever there were functions, we never cared about seven up. It was the bottle cover we were looking for. Poor like this, we jump and pick it. So they came, they saw the cover of the head and it was enough. But she knew the lining and the napkin were not enough for her. She waited. She did what? She waited. Waiting for the cloud to move. She waited. They saw enough for them. It was enough. I want to believe they came to see the body of the Lord Jesus. They didn't see it, but it was enough. She moved closer to the door of the sepulcher. She did not even go in. <laughs> That's why you get to some crusades. <laughs> Aminats, Risikats, Musas will be receiving the testimonies on open air crusade ground. And you see the Jeremiah's and the Daniels clapping. Why? Because what they are seeing is enough for them. But she, she stayed back. And as she peeped, the Bible says she saw an angel, two angels, one seated at the head of where the body of Jesus laid and another one at the foot. The same thing they looked into. They went inside but could not see. Somebody saw from outside. Why? She waited. Waiting for the cloud to move. Tarion. She saw it. And I began to wonder, when did the angels come? And I have two answers. Maybe the angels were there when Peter and John entered. They could not see the angels. Why? Because what they were looking for were the things they saw. Or possibility number two. The angels appeared after they had gone. Because they saw their hearts that they did not really need Jesus. But she saw the angels. And on seeing the angels, she burst into tears. For me, I thought that would be enough for her. Praise God! I have seen an angel. But Christianity is not about angel. It's about the Lord. <laughs> She began to look and to weep. She waited. She wept the more. Have you come to the point where you are waiting for the cloud to move over your spiritual life? Have you ever come to a point where you weep for your life? Lord, why is my Christianity this way? Have you come to a point where you say, God, I will not leave you until I receive a revival? She stood there and as she was weeping, an angel said to her, what do you seek, woman? And she said, they have taken away my Lord. Please, if you know where they took him, tell me that I might go and take him. Meaning she knew what she wanted. What brought her to the sepulchre in the first place? To anoint the body of Jesus on the day of Sabbath, the day after he was buried. But a day of Sabbath in the Jewish land, nobody should do anything. So she waited till the morning of the third day. Now Jesus had disappeared. Has Jesus been taken away from your life and you care less? Mm, the testimony of those days. Ah. Uh -uh. 1994 when I raised my hand like this people were falling this 2018 for God's sake what's happening now 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 faith now faith is the substance of the now 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 what's happening now and just as she turned now turn here now so I'm taking the role of Jesus and Jesus said to her seeing her weeping woman he did not say Mary what are you looking for and she said to him in case you are the gardener taking care of this tomb, please tell me where they took my Lord. The Bible says, for she knew him not. She could not recognize him. Why? Her eyes must have been blood from tears. You know, when you weep a lot, you can't see things. Beloved, if you want to see the Lord, weep a little. Clear your eyes and see him. Don't allow weeping and sorrow to make you lose the identity of your Redeemer. He is so good, eternally good. He's unchangeable. He's a loving father. He cares about you. Don't allow the tears to blow your eyes. So Jesus, seeing that she did not recognize him, now did something. She called her with the normal voice he used to call her. Mary? Rabone! Rabone! He called her. Tarry in the place of prayer. You will hear his voice. That familiar voice. No one will be able to confuse you. This is my father saying, it is well with me. Mary? And she said, Rabone. And then she, he sent him back to the disciples. They were all together. Only Peter and James cared to come. Go and tell them I have risen. If they want more, tell them to meet me. We are Galilee. Because I'm on my way back to my father. I just have pity on them. Seeing you is enough. If they really care to do what? To meet me. 
another opportunity. Let them go and wait in Galilee. While they waited, Thomas could not wait. He went away. He still did not see. We can't go into that this morning. But waiting for the cloud to move. God bless you, my sister. You are clapping for the Lord Jesus. Do it like you mean it. And finally, the place of waiting is a place of making. I'm rounding off in a few minutes. The place of waiting is a place of making. First Kings chapter 6 verse 7. This talks about the quarry. The King James Version says, And the house, when it was in building, listen very well, First Kings 6, 7, And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought there, so that there was neither hammer, nor axe, nor any tool of iron hurt in the house while it was in building. When they were building the house, the Bible says, all through the building, all the stones needed were stones that had been made ready from the quarry. The Revised Standard Version says, when the house was built, it was with stones prepared at the quarry. The Message Bible says, the stone blocks for the building of the temple were all dressed at the quarry. Beloved, your waiting time is your making time. Your waiting time is your preparation time. Waiting time is dressing time. The builder went to the site, measured where the stone will fit, the shape, and went back to the quarry site to instruct the stone cutters to cut according to shape. Because the builder knew what he would use the stone for. Meaning the stone could not escape the quarry until it had been made ready. You are in the quarry of the Lord. He is working on you. Ah, he will allow me to mommy. He is working on you. You are the potter. He is shaping you because he knows where you will fit into. You are wondering, I'm not married. God knows the man is going to fit your life into. You must be fully made. God knows where he's taking you to. You wonder, I don't have children. He knows the height your children will rise to. He is making you because it's your dressing time. There is a preparation time in the house of the confectioner where they mix the kadao, where they mix the flour, where they put it in the oven and then the cake the, 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 the dough we wait patiently in the hot oven afterwards it will be brought out and when it is brought out you discover it is brown colorless but they bring it to the dressing table your dressing table is coming very soon in the name of Jesus Christ I will close with this the conception of Jesus Christ was a great miracle do you agree with me in spite of this Jesus had to wait for the normal nine months during which pregnancies last. The conception was miraculous, but he waited nine months patiently. There is no double promotion in the university as far as I know. You can have it in the primary school. I wonder why parents allow their children to leave primary schools before the final class. Why? They cannot wait. Sorry, it's not a sin. It's a personal opinion. Because I've met teachers who tell me privately that most of these children don't cope in year one. Because they did not finish their syllabus in the primary school. <laughs> but there is no double promotion in the university. If it's a three-year course, you have to wait patiently and finish it. If it's four years, you have to wait patiently and do what? And finish it. And at times, beloved, when you have a carryover, don't get annoyed with God. Get serious so that you can still go. No matter how hard working and experienced the farmer is, he cannot plant yam today and harvest it tomorrow. There are some things they call genetically improved seeds, GIS. That is, they improve them genetically so that they can quickly bring forth fruits. Some of them are not safe for the eating because there is an appointed time for seeds to grow and to bring fruit. When the world says to you, it is getting too late for you. I want to give you a helping hand, beloved. When they say it is getting too late for you, you say to them, you are not the timekeeper of my destiny. <laughs> you know why? You tell them, my God makes everything beautiful in his own time. I will wait for my cloud to move. Don't forget, true prophet Samuel, God said to Saul, now the Lord would have established your kingdom, but now your kingdom shall not continue. Why? He refused to wait for the cloud to move before moving. 
If you wait upon the Lord, you will not waste in the world. If you tarry before the Lord, you will not be sorry in the world. But if you move with a crowd of hurry, you will miss a cloud of glory and end up in the cloud of sorry. Beloved, I don't know what you are trusting God for, but I can hear it loud and clear. Heaven saying something like, Please wait. Your transaction has been processed. Can you hear it? Please wait. Your transaction is being processed. Shall we rise as we sing this song in prayer, which will last just a few minutes? The song says, Give me grace to follow. But we are going to sing it as Give me grace to tarry, that is to wait. Give me grace to tarry. Abundant grace to tarry. Hey. Give me grace to tarry. Your grace is enough for me. Sing it now. Give me grace. Sing it like you are praying it. Yes. Abundant grace to tarry. Close your eyes and sing it. Give me grace to tarry. Your grace is enough. Give me grace to tarry. Your grace is enough. Can you pray this prayer loud and clear? I know your thoughts towards me are thoughts of peace and not of evil. I know you are at work in my situation. Father, give me grace. To wait for my appointed time. Give me grace to wait for the cloud to move. Go ahead and pray that prayer in a minute. Open your mouth and pray that prayer in just one minute. Pray that prayer. Pray that prayer. I don't know what you are trusting God. As a minister of God, as a servant of God, as a child of God, pray, Lord, grace, grace, grace is all I need. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Open your eyes. I'm making just one call. I've told this story before of a journey I was making out of Elorin. I was driving. I parked around of a garage to gauge my tires. A man driving into town parked on the other side of the road out of a garage. He came to me. He said, sir, please can you show me the way to Shobo? I asked where he was coming from. He said he was coming from Abuja. I said, on your way, did you get to a town known as Ajashaipo? He said, yes. Ah, I said it was at Ajashaipo you should have taken the small curve to continue towards Ofa, Erile, Oshobo. But he had traveled around 30 minutes on a wasted journey. So I said, sir, now you have to turn back. Go and reconnect to Ajashaipo. He said, Kai, I missed it because I did not wait to ask. So he wasted time coming and going. Let's close our eyes. I will not take time in making this call so much. You know you have left the cloud of glory at a time. You have moved ahead of the cloud. Ahead. You have moved ahead. And you have come to a point of I don't understand again. My God. But you want to reconnect this morning. I've come back to you, Lord. Give me direction. Have mercy on me. No need to raise your hand. Just come to the altar. Let your neighbor give you room. Come to the altar. And talk to your maker. Lord, help me. God bless you, sister. God bless you, ma. God bless you, sir. Go on, talk to God. The altar is open just for 60 seconds from now. Come and receive mercy. Lord, help me. Help me. Help me, Lord. Or you are, you are at a point where you are seriously shaken. In between two opinions. Lord, I don't know what to do again. I am confused. You have not even taken the step. But you just need the direction. Come and join them. Come and join them. We have 45 seconds more. Perhaps the Spirit of God is telling you. Come and receive grace. Come and receive grace. Come and receive grace. Come and receive mercy for direction. 
go ahead come come as the press team comes forward with their bulletins in their hands come come we have just 30 more seconds talk to your maker not to me i cannot do it i don't answer prayers otherwise i will not have a prayer point of my own cry to the one who can do it lord help me help me help me help me lord deliver me from this state of confusion help me to reconnect lord oh to the point where i made the mistake and retrace my step lord don't allow it to be finished with me my dear kid may me that it is solo see one in now your kingdom would have continued but now your kingdom will not continue lord i have come for mercy i have come for grace we have just 20 more seconds the spirit of god is telling you to come and receive this grace come and join them quickly the window is open this door is open mercy is seriously available now that anointing is heavily available now come 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 and talk to him lord help me help me redirect me reorder my steps help me lord help me daddy in jesus mighty name we pray